So what are you doing before we start recording? Okay, so this is basically for the restoration end of it as well. Um, we're going to have this thing looking like a million bucks. When it's done, it'll look like a brand new saw, except for it have a couple little modifications to it. So just take like a Tupperware container sometimes. All the metal. One thing that's nice about knowing where every little bolt goes is you can do it like this. Otherwise, you'd maybe want to sort it out in little, you know, little containers like that. I think that's for making tea maybe. I'm not sure. And then I use this stuff. Again, obviously don't get paid by these people, but uh, you're just going to dump some of the solution in there. The reason I like a Tupperware container like this is seal it up. Actually, this probably ain't as sealed as good as I would hope. This ain't Tupperware. It's just a random container. You can put this lid on and kind of... But if you leave it sit like overnight and you come out the next day, you can spray it with carb cleaner, brake cleaner, something like that, and it'll look brand new. But you gotta, you know, you gotta leave it soak in there a little bit. Okay. We're gonna start pouring. Okay, so uh, knock that circlip out on the other side. You only need to take one out. Hold the piston so you're not pushing against the connecting rod and bending stuff. And I hold down on this, and if you have to tap, you can get it to go. There it goes. Keep this bearing, do not lose that or let anything get in it, uh, replace it even. And there is the the wrist pin, looks really good. Um, I did check that before I should have mentioned it, but if you're reusing it, you wanna check play, you know, with the, the piston, uh, the bearing, the wrist pin. If you, if you can move the piston back and forth like that, a lot of play in there. There's gonna be some play there has to be, but you, you know, you wanna check that a little bit. So this thing did get a little bit hot at a couple times, but you can tell by the discoloration uh, purple, you don't want to see purple, and you can see on the inside of this. So it did get, uh, you know, they all get heat though. Yeah. But one place you want to definitely, you don't want to see like, I've seen this a couple times, you get like a purple line down here. You get really bad heat somewhere, you'll have like purple. Another thing to look for, this one's in really good shape, the inside of the crankcase, the paint will be flaking off, uh, bubbling off. I'm not aware, aware of a way to fix it. Uh, I take this and I just use a scotch Brite pad and I get it down to the metal and it usually stops it. So John's just scrubbing that with a scotch Brite yeah, pad, just kind of smoothing, smoothing yeah. off where we're using this thing. And yeah, that doesn't look too bad. It looks no. pretty smooth actually. I, yeah, you'll see okay. some of them that are just, literally there's no paint left in them. These these saws, they are what they are, man. You gotta you gotta understand what these things do. They're, yeah. They live a tough life. They're. It's, there's a lot that's asked of these saws when they're up there ripping away at these logs, but man, they are something else. Impulse line, intake boot, anything of these hard rubber parts, you're gonna wanna reuse them, or not not reuse them. You're gonna wanna get rid of them and start new just because uh, that's where your air leaks are gonna come from. You'll feel when you use carb clean and you clean out bearings, you'll feel any you know defect or if you've got any grit in them. If, you know, when you put oil on them, they smooth it out all the time anyway so before that this is the true test of if your bearings are grinding and they okay. weren't at all nice. so even doing this you know it's, it's not we're not running the saw obviously but i do like to get some oil in them and those are super smooth now here's another important thing these th this might look bad I'll see how that's moving back and forth yeah that is common in these they, they do float a little bit okay. you don't want what they call end to play so i can't move the the end of the crankshaft up and down. Okay. But it will move side to side like this. That's normal, that there's nothing wrong with it. Okay. People, it's another one that kind of throws people off, but you don't, if you grab the end of this crankshaft and you can move it up and down, yeah. your bearings are bad. You 100% need to replace them. I like to use the the old base gasket to, to time it because when you put a new one on, it's gonna be, a, I mean, we're talking just a very small difference, but it's going to be compressed when we tighten it down to this height. Okay. So that's going to give us our, basically our port timing height. So, all right, size. gloving up. Yeah, it's going to be boring. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, usually I'm very interesting and hilarious, but this is just basically talking port timing, uh, the different effects you're going to get from adjusting port time height. And we're also going to do uh, shave the base on the lathe. And that is gonna add compression. We'll talk about all that when we get to it. But the gist of it is we have started, we have pressure back tested the crankcase. That's good. That's step number one. And now we have the new piston in it and we are going to get after it. So I used to you know, tell everybody that you're gonna get all this extra performance and all that stuff. And I knew it was true, but 
the easiest way to explain it is uh, one of the, the saws that I do a lot of is the 461. I ran, I know, I've never ran a stock one until a few months back. When I ran a stock saw, it, it opened my eyes. Like they are not even close to the same. Uh, trying to think of percentages. I think on a ported saw, a good one, you're gaining like 30%, which is a lot. Also, they're gonna run cooler. They're gonna run more efficiently saving time on the job. I mean, that's for you guys, like that's kind of the question too. I'd ask the guys out on the job. It's, it's got to save so much time. Yeah. Everybody I know that once they start running ported saws, they never go back. This just, you really notice a big difference. Yes, exactly. When you do, and that's another thing that really reassured me is once you do a ported saw for somebody, you basically have a customer for life. They're always going to get more ported saws. They, you know, they're going to come back to you and they can't, it's like me. I can't run a stock saw. It's weird to me. It feels like there's something wrong with them. <laughs> yeah, there's no going back. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know if you've had a ported 200 or not, but these saws are really good right right off the shelf. You can't buy them anymore, but there ain't nothing wrong with the 200T stock, really. They're a great saw. This one's going to be what uh, I don't do these saws anymore, but I used to call it the Limb Reaper build, which is a clever name, but it's a 200T with a 020T top end. So you're going to see that these transfers are a little narrower, but there is no partition wall in the transfers. And the reason that they're narrower is because you could possibly catch a ring. Like I, I've, I've experimented with all this stuff, but grinding these out, you can, but you can only go so high. You have to measure with your piston at bottom dead center. And uh, you can grind up to there, but you can't go higher because it will catch a ring on this lip. So this is a this is a 200 T. This is a 200 T. This is a 020. So yes. this was the predecessor to the 200 T, which is the predecessor to the 201, which we don't have here. And so this is the I mean these were popular what over 20 years ago. Oh yeah, it's been a while. Like 90s. And, yep. And then there the 020 T, there was two different versions of that. Like there was ones that were all metal body. I you probably seen Yeah, some of them. I remember those. And then there was also the plastic more modern version that they called the 020 T. Yeah. And really similar. Yeah, it's 200. similar to this. There's really hardly any differences, but the old metal body, that's a way different saw. I yeah, mean, that's that a, things would get hot. Oh, man, yeah. it's like an oven. But yes, that's the that's the difference really with this. The numbers and the squish clearance are very, very minimal difference. But you got more to work with you on got the 020 cylinder. Yeah, so these that's are... Why we're gonna be, that's why we're going to be machining that one. Yep, these are, okay. these are great cylinders. It's kind of a... Not a secret. I'm sure there's other people that do it, but any of the, the Limb Reaper builds that I've done... I uh, have had this cylinder on it, and they're also converted to quarter inch pitch chain, which we're gonna do. And we're gonna see if this thing will run a 20 inch bar. So I'm kind of nervous, but I think we can pull it off. It's, uh, it's a tall tall order, but these are really powerful saws. But I'm super excited to get this done and see what it'll do. Now we have the degree wheel set up. I did not set it to bottom dead center, uh, top dead center, just because I figured it'd be a good time to, uh, to show how to do that. So you're gonna wanna keep two bolts handy. Intake side is obviously in the impulse, the impulse uh, line is going to be on that side. So the way that I do it is I cut the squish clearance first. So we're going to, we're going to set up the degree wheel and we're going to show how to basically, I call it zeroing it out, but it's not exactly zeroing it out. And then for this, we need a piston stop. Best way to set up a degree wheel, the proper way is to use a piston stop. Uh, I've seen some people that basically just eyeball it. That is not the correct way. You're, you might get close, but you're not gonna get right on. And these, these saws especially, the, you're, we're not dealing with wide numbers. It's very, very uh, meticulous work, especially on these 200 Ts. So I'm going to find, I'm gonna get the piston towards the bottom and that's gonna be our bottom dead center. Every degree wheel is gonna have BDC, TDC, bottom dead center, top dead center. So I know I'm pretty close right there, and this is where the piston stops. What are we measuring here? Like I, I you, you just try to talk to me like I'm an idiot because I have no idea what I'm looking at here. Okay, so this is gonna basically determine how we map out our cylinder, and to know where we're at, like you can't stick a ruler inside of here, really, and measure. You know what I mean? Is that's yeah. how to do that? So it takes it, you know, a, a, a circle which is the full rotation, and then you know when this exhaust port opens when it when it closes your durations they call that okay uh, and then that can 
that allows you to know where to set them uh, because everybody will say, or not everybody, but you'll hear that you lower your intake port and you raise your exhaust port on all the, all the saws you do. That's not true. You don't always do that. In fact, on a 200T, you will lose power if you follow that rule. Okay. So that's why you want to measure it because you know that certain numbers work and you want to make sure that you're not going past it and you want to make sure that you're gaining you know, it, it tells you how much you, how much room you have. Yeah, who taught you? Uh, an old guy is uh, no longer with us, but Jim Nelson, he was a old two-stroke mechanic, and he kind of taught me on dirt bikes, and that's what I used to do. It's funny, that's how Gordy got started, building saws too. Huh? Yeah. He started with dirt bikes. Yes, and then, and then Gordy is the one that, that really, you know, with the chainsaw world especially, took me under his wing, showed me... A lot of stuff. I've learned so much from him. It's crazy. Yeah, Gordy owns West Coast Saw. Yes, West he makes Coast all Saw. The, he makes all that stuff. And he is a, a very good guy. Not many yeah. people would share information with a new kid coming out. I call myself a kid. I'm almost I'm 40. <laughs> a kid at heart. And uh, he, was, he was totally okay with showing me the tricks. And now we're good friends. Okay, so the, the purpose of the piston stop is... This is fixed. This is threaded in. It does not move. So okay. now I can I can rotate my cylinder and it's going to stop when the piston hits the piston stop. So I know when I go to the right and stop, to the left and stop, I'm going to need the same number on my degree wheel. That's going to determine true top dead center. Okay. So we'll come over here. I rotated. So we'll look at, we're on, we're rotated this way and we're at about 28. We're going to come back. Oh, that was just dumb luck. 28. So uh, if you were off a little bit, say if you were 30 and 26, you would know you got to go to 28 degrees. And so that's what I'm measuring right there is off this wire. So we're at 28 degrees that way. 28 degrees that way. Now we'll take this piston stop out and we have full rotation. And there are countless YouTube videos on this. I understand this is just how I do it. And I'm not claiming... I'm some expert. My ways are the best ways. They're the only ways. This is just how I do it. Take it for, you know, what you want. And I, I think everybody has their own little methods. But this is not debatable. This, this is how you find true top dead center, bottom dead center okay. with a piston stop. Don't eyeball it. That's not the correct way to do it. Now we can get all of our numbers and we will write them down stock. I'm going to start by finding the squish clearance. So you're gonna use solder and you're gonna pinch it between. There's some way for me to get in there. Can you, we wanna come from, to the other side maybe? So I'm basically pushing it yeah. against the cylinder wall. Now I'm rotating, I'm turning the saw over and that piston is smashing the solder against the, the combustion chamber. See how that thinned that out? Oh yeah. Okay, so that is gonna be our squish height. And you wanna rotate it a few times, let it smash it good. Uh, don't just uh, hit it once because it will it will change. Always clean off your calipers. What's that thing called? This is a micrometer, zeroed out. And then when you close it, it should go back to zero. Okay, okay so we're zeroed out. I, I zero this thing out like a hundred million times when I do a saw, just so you guys know that, if you see me hit that button. So now, I'm gonna take a measurement there. I was gonna say they're usually about 35 thousandths. That's what that is. I measure. This is very important too. Uh, people have asked me questions and I've given them numbers. When we're measuring a squish clearance, everybody just does inches. So it's 35 thousandths of an inch. Someone did this with millimeters or something and they screwed it up. And I was like, oh, sorry. I thought everybody knew that. So we're dealing with inches when we're looking at squish clearance. Okay. So we're at about 36. I'm going to start light. So I want to go for on this one, we're actually going to go a little rowdy. We're going to go to 19 thousandths. Usually 20 thousandths is where you want to be for squish clearance. You're shrinking the size of the chamber that when you, on your power stroke or ignition stroke, uh, it makes that explosion with the, you know, with the gases and that's what powers the saw. And we're shrinking that down so you have the same amount of material in a smaller space. Okay. You know, so if you had, if you like, you were filling a water balloon and you could fill it pressurized, it would, that balloon would get so big if we're shrinking that down. So if you had a balloon that was this big full of water and you could shrink it down, there's more pressure, I guess, inside of it. This gains compression and compression 
does relate to power. Some people will argue that, but it 100%, it does relate to power. It's not everything, but it, it definitely is a lot of it. To do that, we have to go to the lathe and we are going to machine the base. So I had about 36 thousandths on the squish clearance. We're gonna go to 19. So obviously we're taking like 17 thousandths off of it. And uh, I'll have to show you over there how I measure that out, how I machine it, and hopefully it goes well. So we'll see you at the lathe. This is the, this is the, this thing was a game changer and I'm so glad to have it. I got a really good deal on it, but I get asked all the time about the lathe, what you should get, uh, what's involved. And I'll tell you right off the bat, I got no problem saying it. I paid $1,500 for this lathe. I got a really good deal on it. It's a great lathe. I spent over that, well over that, just getting it wired in because uh, you got to have three phase. As you see, I have a, a small shop. This is just a third stall garage. Uh, so I had to have the three phase wired in. I, all of your mandrels, they call this a mandrel, is what we're gonna put the cylinder on. And uh, to make the mandrels, to get the tool post holder, the, the cutters, all that stuff, I stuck well over 1500 just getting the lathe set up, if that makes sense. So if you are on a budget, uh, make sure that if you are buying a used lathe that you know what you're getting. You know, I didn't even think at the time to really ask about all the, the extras. So like I didn't have a live center, they call this a live center. Long story short, just make sure that you know that you're gonna have to spend quite a bit to get it wired in, at least uh, 500 to maybe even $1,000 depending, and you're gonna stick a lot of money into the, the tooling and all that stuff. You can for an at-home at -home, uh, port job and decking, they call that decking is when you're, when you're shaving the base of the cylinder. Um, people have had like a, a really flat piece of granite, I guess works really good. Uh, I've never, I've never had to do it this way, but if it's perfectly flat, you can lay uh, sandpaper down and you can work the cylinder back and forth like this. And you're basically sanding off the bottom uh, that will work. Um, also you can take out the paper gasket that, that comes in these and use a gasket maker. I use uh, HT Durco HT if I'm going to use it, uh, but. Uh, with the lathe, you can use the base gasket. That's, that's the way I like to do it. But uh, removing the paper gasket and using the gasket maker, you will gain uh, quite a bit. Um, we could measure it, but I think it's like eight or nine thousandths of an inch you can gain. Because the paper gasket's so thick. It's thick, yes. And the, okay. the gasket maker, the sealant is very thin. Okay. And, I mean, you can do it that way, but that is only going to get you so far. And you're eyeballing. Yeah, you're basically, you're basically, yeah, you're guessing. You're, you're yeah. using a... Uh, material that's thinner but like say in this situation we're dropping 17 thousandths if we did a base gasket to leak we would be about halfway there okay so you're not you're not getting the full potential it, it, it would help if, if this is just all at home and you want to port your saw and you want to do a gasket to leak i would recommend it because it's it's going to help uh, okay just make sure you use the right material and make sure you do a good job and pressure back test so we're just kind of setting this one up i'm zeroing everything out here with my uh the dial indicator I use a three jaw chuck because we're not building something that's going to the moon. And in the end, I've, I found that this is, uh, it's just a really good setup. I think most of the saw builders that I know use a three jaw chuck, the four jaws, you have to make sure you get that thing super dead on, but this is just kind of finding zero. It's a little boring. So I get it really close and then I tighten it down. And all of this is kind of like, I understand that you either have a lathe and know how to use it or you don't. But uh, I like to hear myself talk and Jacob likes to film. So we're going to talk about it. <laughs> Match made in heaven. Now I put the cylinder on and all my mandrels are just friction fit pressure. So I'm going to run this down here. And this tailstock is what this is called. I know some terminology, but I'm not some lathe and machining wizard where I know every little bit of terminology. So go ahead and correct me if you want. And I'll make sure I don't reply. I'm pretty picky too. Like I've even heard like other people like, you don't have to be with more than like a, a couple thou, you're good. I'm like, really? Like why not get it perfect? So I probably spend more time doing this than most. People ask me all the time about bench top lathes. So I don't personally know, but I know someone that has one because these are lathes you can get for like a thousand dollars, I guess, at like a, a Harbor Freight or something. And they don't, they run on, your, you know, 110 or whatever is electrical, the standard electricity, you don't have to get anything wired in. 
and they do work. I don't have any experience with them, but uh, it, for these uh, cylinders, like the biggest you're gonna do really is an 880, and they fit, they work. So, I mean, that's all I can really answer on it because I haven't personally used one, but I get that question all the time. And I get it, like, yeah, how nice would that be? You don't have to get it wired in, you don't have to, like, this thing's heavy, it's huge. So now I have, this is all uh, perfectly centered. We are locked in with the tailstock. So my, my cutter, see how I got that scratch here from going around? Mm -hmm. I know my cutter is making contact. So I know that's basically zero. I'm gonna call that 1,000th because I scratched a little bit off. And this method has always worked really good for me. So I'm gonna, I run the dial indicator in a little bit. So I'm gonna go to 1,000th. Okay, so this now I'm moving the carriage and that is gonna show that needle over there moving back and forth. Oh, you can see it from that angle. I thought you were not. So that's gonna tell us our measurements. So now if we go back to zero, I can get this is kind of touchy. Okay, so we're on zero. Now when I run this out, perfect. So it's barely making contact. And you've seen how I moved that, like over an inch. So now I went back to zero, and now yeah. it's barely making contact, so we know that that is our zero. Now we can take that 17 thousandths off by using this, this uh, dial indicator, and that's how you measure it. Because people ask how you measure how much you're taking off. That's how you do it. Okay. You don't really use a ruler. So as made. you turn that, that machine's going to move closer, yep. and that's going to change. Exactly, yep. Okay. And then we go to 17. That's measuring in thousandths of an inch. We're going to go to that 17. And that's why people, when, you, when you're talking squish numbers, that's why people use inches. Because okay. the dial indicators are the ones that I've seen, at least all of them are, in inches. So, all right, we got the lathe going. We're at zero. I am going to, I start on the inside and come out, and then I go from the outside and go in. It doesn't really matter. You don't want to take more than uh, 10 thousandths at a time. And on my first cut, I take a little bit less, so I'm at about 8 thousandths. It doesn't matter because we know the end number we're going for. So now I'm just running it out. And it's taking off material. About halfway. And I mean, the lathe is gonna make sure that everything is perfectly squared. So that was about eight thousandths. And on our last cut, we wanna take very little material off. So I'm gonna take about another, we'll do another eight, so I'll be at about 16. If you want your finished cut to be really clean, so you take a little bit of material off. And then you go in and it doesn't matter if it hits the mandrel, that's just that's just steel. So I go kind of slow at the end. We're so just you're gonna, gonna do one more pass? Yep, yeah, and we're just gonna take off like 1,000. And uh, I, I realized after that this wasn't on zero, it was on a different number, but I'm so used to doing this that I know, you know what I mean? I start. I can start on any number, it doesn't yeah. matter because I know okay. how much 17 is on it. So okay. I'm taking like one and a half thousandths off this final cut, and I do it really evenly even do an auto feed if I really want to, but this is going to give us a really clean finish on this. The cuts before it don't really matter as much. And we might need to adjust this, so if I got to come back over here and do another thousandths off it or something, that's okay. But this way, this is our finish, our finish height. We can do it really nice. The less material you take off of your last pass is going to be the most even finish. Perfect. So, we shut her off. Looks good. Get it over here. Looks good, Jacob. I'd hire me. Nice. <laughs> so there we go. Looks shiny. Awesome. Yeah, it looks good. So now we come remeasure our squish clearance. So now we're gonna remeasure again. New piece of solder, uh, you don't ever, I don't at least, you don't use the same piece again. So, and I can feel, just from doing so many, I can feel that we're right there. So we're gonna be pretty close. So see how I'm running that against it a bunch of times? You wanna go until you basically don't feel it anymore. Yeah, we're pretty good right there. We're gonna take like, a, just a little bit off of it, just so we got this thing perfect. Okay. So. Go back over there and repeat the process. We're not cutting corners around here, not on this one. But I tell you what, it's better to, to be cautious. So to add material back to these is really tough. To put the <laughs> aluminum back on, not as easy as you think.
which means we're taking such a minimal amount off of this crazy. Yeah, it's like nothing, right? Anything. But I mean, you know, we're dealing with a half a thou here. Like, that's absolutely nothing. Half of one thousandth of one inch. Yeah, and then this um, is even less, but I am going to go do it over time. Go one more time. So, I mean, we're barely touching it. It's really, this is just taking off if there's any little high spots. So, that's going to be pretty good. So, I'm really happy with that. And, uh, looks good. I mean, can't argue with that. I, I'd be happy with that if well, someone did that to my saw. It gets repetitive and monotonous, but you can't cut corners. Well, I think your saw speaks for themselves. That's why you've got, and you got a whole attic full and you got all those, <laughs> yeah, right. you know? I mean, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been crazy. I think once, there's a lot of guys that do this, uh, calling that out, but once uh, you can start getting, you know, do really good work, stand behind your work, that's another one. I stand behind my saws, you, a lot of, some guys, they won't. They send you a ported saw, but they don't guarantee anything. And I kind of think that's, that's a little strange. So what happens if my 261 blows up? You fix it? Uh, what well, I think I do like a one year policy. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you're past that. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> There's always a catch. There's yeah, always, always yeah, a catch. Yeah, to an extent, I guess I should say that. You don't stand behind it for life, but, uh, you know, yeah, you've had that thing for a while. And it's, that, that should dispel that myth. I like, talk about that right now, too. You always hear, my, my number one question when someone's ready to send a saw or thinking about it, I've heard ported saws blow up. Uh, yeah, it depends who ports them. They don't last long. It depends on who Yeah, who for it. sure. Absolutely. Yeah, we're right there. 19th out. Perfect. This one's going to be rowdy. And now we're going to write down our stock port numbers. I think we we're at point, yeah, 036. Now we're at point zero one nine. For those that want to argue that going below 20 thousandths is not good, cool. I like how you're just like assuming everybody watching this video is going to know how to port saws. Yeah. Right. <laughs> They're going to like... So, yeah. Well, not a lot of people know how to do this. I think... I, I don't think, think you're, I don't does. think you're gonna get beat up too bad in the comments. The the, the builders do, so I'm at the wrong side here. Yeah. I think you spent too much time on Facebook. It's oh my god, much. Facebook was brutal. So all us saw builders are egomaniacs and we're attention hogs, so we're on Facebook, Instagram, and if we tell a number, say this is what I run for Squish, then all the guys that got the saw they argue with the other guys that run yeah. a different number. Nineteen thousands to twenty thousands, come on guys. <laughs> I mean we're gonna argue about that because some guy said so. Yeah, cool. yeah it's, it's ridiculous. It's the same thing with the climber community. Everybody argues. Yeah. Just, it's a it's a point like like this rope's better than that rope, and it's like, are you right? serious? Like, yeah. what is it really that different? Because you you're know? breaking all. I, I broke three it's last like, oh, week. This is three percent elongation. And this <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two two point nine percent. It's like, come on, man. We, we, we all got the same job here. Oh you know? my god. Yeah. <laughs> I basically say if the thing runs really good when you're done, the guy did a good job. Right. All right. So we're done on the lathe. We have checked the squish clearance. We're right where we want to be. Now it's time to measure the port timing. Now intake uh, height is measured after bottom dead center. So you're going to come from the bottom, move the piston up and right. Oh, I'm looking at the side the wrong way. Sorry. So the, the engine is turning over this way. We go after bottom dead center and I got to come to this huh. side, but and then we are going to look just when that intake cracks open, like when it barely cracks open. Yeah. So, okay. Right when it starts to crack open. Okay. And let me, I can't see in there. Sorry. Right there. Right when it starts to crack open. And we're going to come over here. And this is why I don't, you don't necessarily want to move ports on everything. You want to check first. We are at about 79 degrees and it's measured in degrees. Okay. Uh, 80 degrees is about where I'd like to be. And I would consider that along the sides of maxed out uh, okay. you can go lower i understand that but we're at uh we're at 79 i triple checked everything so if you're not looking at your wheel and you redo it you know that you're not biased looking at your wheel so if you do double check your numbers 79 so yeah okay so that is the intake we're going to write that down 79 degrees and that's again after bottom dead center uh, we are going to go to exhaust so exhaust you go past top dead center and then you are going to come down and you want to look you shine your flashlight through the spark plug hole right when you start to see that 
little of the light starts to break through that top there. I think you can see that, right? Yep. That is 98 degrees, and these are, almost every one of them is around 79 or 80, and around 97 to 98, so that is the exhaust. 98 degrees. Okay. Okay. Is that simple enough? Yep. And this is this is stock numbers now. So the blowdown is a little more complicated, and actually, I could do this a uh, way that everybody can see what I'm doing. Uh, I didn't think of this before, but shouldn't take too long to set up. So this is a bore scope. And again, blowdown is after top dead center. So you're gonna wanna run the piston all the way to the top and then down. So that is the top of the uh, transfer port, the uppers. Okay. So we wanna get that measurement right where it cracks. So I'm running, I run it back and forth a bunch of times to get like, you know what I mean? I'm trying yeah. to figure where it opens, where it closes. So right about there, that's gonna be right where the transfer port uh, is gonna start opening because our piston is going down. Again, so we're going up 90, 100, 10, 24. So 124 is the, is the height of the transfers, the uppers. And uh, basically the way I do this, uh, we're going to stock here, is I don't write the number down of the transfer port height. I do what they call blowdown, which is the number, it's why you're measuring your upper transfers. So blowdown in simplest terms is the number that you got for your height of your uppers minus the degrees that you have for your exhaust. So we were at 124. You know, I'm writing this down just to get the basically. So our blowdown is going to be 26, if that makes sense. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. 124 minus 98. If my math is correct, it's 26, right? I just go to 100, so I just take 24 off, go to 100, and then add two. Okay. That's how I do my simple math. But uh, that's our number for our blowdown. <laughs> Doesn't seem so simple to me. Oh, really? <laughs> but yeah. I just yeah, cool. dealing with hundreds. And this is just stuff that you do. It's amazing how much it's it's amazing how much goes into this. Yeah, there's it's a like, lot that goes into it. This is very precise stuff you're doing. It really yeah, it's it's uh the measuring is the most important part and again, double checking measurements. Now, I it might not be good for film, but I do those numbers again. I do them all over. Yeah. Again. So, yeah. I'm gonna, I'll do that. You can film it if you want. It might be boring, but I'm just going to run through them again to make sure I got everything right. Okay. I didn't know if you guys would be able to see very well on camera, but yeah, you can look because not everybody's got a bore scope. Yeah. So there, if you were looking, doing this at home and you're looking through your spark plug hole, that's what you're looking right. for, for the height of the, the upper transfers. Okay. I did it with a bore scope because I didn't know if this would feel. Uh, yeah, I can see it. This would work on film very well, but I can't quite see where it is. So I get a little bit, yeah, so it'd be right. right there somewhere. Okay. I double checked it and I had 126. What or yeah, 126 was the height of my uppers, and then so that would actually be a blow down to 28. That's why I double check everything. Okay, so nice. I checked three times and I got the 126 two times basically. So I'm using that bore scope and us kind of being in a crowded area. Uh, I was off a couple. So yeah, we are we double triple checked everything and made adjustments. So we are good. We are at 28 blow down, which seems more more like it just from doing enough of these. Your exhaust height is gonna deal with your top range RPMs. If you you raise uh, lower this number by raising your the exhaust roof, the top of the exhaust is what you're going after, you're gonna gain RPMs, but you're gonna get to a point where you lose torque. You could put your exhaust at 92 if you wanted to, it'd probably be a screen machine, but it won't cut worth the worth the darn. And then the intake, the lower you go on your intake. You can go down to about 80 is about where I go on a really crazy saw when you're getting after it. You can go lower than 80, but we're right there pretty much 79. And that is going to deal with fuel delivery. You're going to get, you're adding fuel by going down on your intake, if that makes sense. The rules that you'll hear, everybody say you raise your exhaust, lower your intake. That does not always apply. There's other things that you have to worry about. Now, when we, we dropped the cylinder by shaving the base remember that yeah there's a couple things that you want to make sure that you are aware of before you do that i should have explained that but i i've done enough of these to know that i'm not in going to be in trouble but we're going to run this cylinder to top dead center i'm going to scribe a line on this piston right here 
It's not bad for it? No, absolutely not. It's it's just barely barely scratching the surface. Go to the intake side, my handy little chainsaw stand. And then I run to bottom dead center. Doesn't matter which way we go on this one. And I'm just going to, you see how I'm just like lightly doing that? That's yeah. why it's, it won't hurt if you go light. Um, it's just hard to get like, you, maybe a pencil or something would work in there. But now we're gonna take the cylinder off and be able to see our, our marks. Okay, so when you are decking a cylinder, we'll go to this exhaust side, you should be able to see it. Can you see that line I scribed? Probably barely, but. Yeah, just a little bit. Okay, so we know that if we go, if that line is basically at the bottom, we can measure that with a micrometer. We don't need to, this would be before you do the machining basically. Now, if you drop that cylinder too far, that, you know what I mean? That skirt is gonna be above the floor of your exhaust. Okay. They call that free porting. Uh, you wanna make sure that you are aware of that on a saw that you are, are not comfortable with, uh, that you've never done. And say if you're squish clearance, you could go down, you know, 25 thousandths, you could take it down. If you scribe that line and you measure and you only have, you know, 15 thousandths of room, you don't wanna drop your cylinder because you'll, you'll be free porting. You can free port saws and some people do like to do that. I understand that. I'm just saying that's something to be aware of. Okay. You know what I mean? Like you can do all kinds of weird stuff. And then when I scribe the line on the intake side, that's so hard to see. I didn't push very hard, but you want to also be aware where your, your rings are. On some of these saws, you'll hear a lot of guys say you don't want to have a ring below the roof of your intake. Right, Jacob? You hear that all the time. Right, the yeah. Saw, all these guys that build saws, you hear it all the time. It's constantly like... Okay. This is why I don't listen to saw forums, and I'm not saying these guys don't know what they're talking about or nothing like that. I just think a lot of people that comment on them aren't really aware of this. So this, this might really shock people, but... You, you, like Jacob said, you hear it all the time on these forums. You don't want to have a ring below the roof of your exhaust. We took what sixteen thousand saw. Yeah, that's a lot more than six. That's the this saw stock has a ring go below the roof of the intake. So there's one of the rules that you hear all the time. Shattered. What's the two hundred T? Is one of the best running saws of all time. Best performance, yeah. power to weight. Everybody loves them. That has a ring below the roof of the intake stock before we touch anything. So I wouldn't want the second ring to go below it. Uh, Dude, it just it has to do with like sealing. So okay. I know I don't want to raise the the intake roof very much because I don't want that second ring going below it. You know, even even half the ring where it's at is already pushing it. So that's why you gotta be very careful on these cylinders. Don't just start taking material off. Uh, these actually run worse. If you follow the general rule of lowering your intake, raising your exhaust, you'll lose power. A lot of this is about widening uh, shaping and, and flow. Pol a really good polished exhaust port. The machining does a lot. A lot of guys will just actually just machine these. They just deck them and they leave them. So we have all of our numbers. Now it's time for the fun part. So I'm gonna start porting. So a good way to mark your cylinder is using a, a piston ring and you can set it down in there. And then I just make sure that that gap is not anywhere in, in the ports. And then you can use a piston to adjust the height of your rings and bring them wherever you want to be. So like you can see it down through there. So I'm pushing it down and like I'll stop it there. And then I'll just, this is just for an example. This is not where I'm going to put anything, but I just use a marker. There's all kinds of stuff you can use. And the reason I start at the bottom is so you don't go past it, you know, bleeding and all that and drags the marker, but so yeah. it's just a good way to draw markings on your, uh, okay. on your cylinder. We're not changing the, the port timing on this very much at all. Uh, the 200 T is such a good running saw right out of the box. The reason for that is that it has good numbers, just factory. The numbers that I would want are 80 degrees on the intake and on a 200 T they already have all the top end in the world. So, I'm gonna to try to help by adding fuel 
and uh, 98 degrees is good enough on the exhaust. I don't want to go any lower on the intake and I'm already where I want to be on the exhaust, if that makes sense. You're not going to gain anything by going lower on the intake, or raising the exhaust. These things have top end like it's going out of style. On this saw, we want to add, if we can only go a degree or so, we want to add it on the low end. That's the numbers I've always ran with these and it worked really good, so. Okay. And so basically with that, I know that I'm not moving my exhaust height. So I just mark a line straight across on the top and the bottom. So I'll try to get this one as close as I can on the bottom. Right there. So that rings right there. And all I'm doing is I'm drawing lines so I know that it is, I can square it off a little bit if I can get away with it. And I'm not gonna be able to move it much. So you can see on the bottom there, it would be the top if you're looking at it like this. Okay, yeah. See how it's curved? Yeah. And I drew my straight line? Yeah. So I know that would be the max that I can go if if I wanted to square the exhaust up. Okay. And it's a guide. It's basically a guide to know that how, how far I can go. And then also, we drew lines on this before. Yeah, okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. cool. So, and then we have, I drew the whole shape of it. I have this traced out. And now you want to leave a good 50 thousandths of room between the edge of this port and the edge of the skirt on the piston. So we'll zero this out. So we have about a hundred thousandths and we can go 50 thousandths over basically. So that is how much you'd want to widen that. I would not recommend going any further. 50 thousandths is, is a good number. And that would be your max, you know, honestly, if you wanted to leave it or go a little wider, just don't go any closer than that. The piston in the 200T is a typical steel piston where it's a piston ported. So it has windows in the piston, those two windows. And that's what's going to allow uh, movement through the transfers. And it's a non-supported piston. So there's no material underneath that crossbar, basically. And this would be, this is out of a Husky slash John's Rude. And... You can see that there's no no windows in there, but it's it's supported. If that makes sense, okay. so that's why it, when when doing the the steels that have this style piston, you got to keep that in mind when you're doing a number of different things. If you're opening up these windows, uh, moving ports, you just gotta want to be aware that uh, it's it, it, you know this is their claim to fame. Though I'm not saying that's a bad piston; they run great. They're light, you know, they're lighter that way. There's a lot of advantages to it, but just be aware of it. Okay. So we are going to move the the intake lower and I'm going to mark this out. And the reason to push it down with the piston is that it keeps it straight. Oh yeah, I like that. Also the, the intake port, same deal. Looks like it's a small port, the intake and exhaust, but if you think about the actual size of the cylinder, that's a that's a pretty adequate intake. Um, some some size you'll see that they'll have a relatively small intake port and an exhaust port. Uh, not to bang on huskies, but like uh, some of the huskies are like that. But uh, if you think about it, you don't need to go wild on these things. Um, there's also a, velocity is a thing to consider as well. If you open them up and you just make them huge. Yeah, you're gaining the, the volume it can take, but you're you're taking the velocity down, if that makes sense. Okay. Like blowing through a straw. If you blow through a small straw, you can get a lot of you know movement through it. You take a big straw, and your lungs are empty. I am going to measure this. Measuring these, I go from the top down. Okay. That's a lot of measuring. Yeah, but this is a real simple measurement. I basically am gonna go no more than 11 thou or so, and right there so i just you can do this all kinds of different ways i just zero it out and then i go eleven thousand i go negative eleven thousands man those are small movements oh it's so small now i'm gonna go i'm gonna leave it a little bit higher yeah that's right where my mark is so that actually worked out really good so now i know the max that i can go is to the bottom of that purple mark so you can see that that is all the material in this now, some saws are way different, say a 461. I'm taking like a quarter inch off of those ports. These are good out of the box. That's the biggest mistake that people make on the 200T when they want to port them or even, uh, you know, people that do port saws, you, they start to lose power if you move these ports, I'm telling you. Okay. If you want to try it and lose power, go ahead, but it's you're not gaining anything. So our blowdown was 
uh, 28. And I some of some saws I like to run a really tight blowdown, like even up to 20, close to 20. Uh, I run a blowdown of 25 on the 200T. That's that's a good number that I've uh, just done enough of them and I've stuck with that number and they've been that's been a good number to stick at. So 98 and 25. So the blowdown also does determine or is dependent on your exhaust height. So you want to make sure you know where your exhaust is going to be or or get it where it needs to be before you adjust your blow down so otherwise you're going to be off a little bit this one i'm going to move 30 thousandths so i'm going to push this down so then i'm going to measure from the top again and what i'm doing is i'm finding the height that it's at so right there is where i'm at that's where it has, is currently you get a little bit edge right there the same thing i'm going to go a little past it and then when I draw my line, I know I have my limit. So yeah, like 33 is pretty good. So they are not going to move very far with the, the champering. They're probably just going to, I'll probably clean them up. Always draw your lines and then measure after you have your lines drawn. That's the way I do it at least. 30, 30, yeah, 36 thousandths. So I'm not going to go any higher than the, the top of that mark. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. I am going to widen your exhaust a little bit on this one. This is kind of dependent on how, what you're going to use it for. And, uh, you know, widening an exhaust, you also can take into account that you can catch a ring easier. The wider the space for the exhaust, the more your, your ring can expand. It could possibly catch on that exhaust roof. So you want to be aware of that too. Long process, Jacob. See, it's not... Little cupcakes and rainbows. <laughs> I think we just grind around. It's not as easy as it sounds. You it's know? just a lot of. It's a real meticulous work, and what's funny is I'm not really a patient guy either. But this, I just have patience for this. And it looks like I mean we're good, good all the way to the corner. So we're good to go on this thing, man. So I'm gonna start with getting the intake where I want it. And I'm gonna square the bottom up a little bit. Now we're grinding. Yeah, now we're grinding. Bottom. I do the flip upside down for that edge. And I'm going to square it up a bit. Okay, and then I am going to also, we had room to on the top when we measured and scribed that mark on the piston. So we know we have room, and this is a uh, not really a secret. There's a lot of people that do this and know this trick, but this is going to help in the long run. I'll explain that when I get the shape up down. Sorry, I'm going to move this thing around. <laughs> yeah, on no, a lot. It's all good. I'm just like... There's like certain positions that I got to see. So I get the shape relatively in check where I want it and this look I'm gonna fine-tune it a little bit but you can kind of see I'll draw here I'll draw a straight line that'll be maybe easier for the eye to see what I'm what I'm trying to do okay here. that's that's a straight line up the micrometer and you can see how I have room on the top and the bottom we don't want to go any wider okay but you see how it's still pretty rounded yeah and if you look at this the other side of the intake you see how I got that more squared off we're gonna go for that basically okay uh, i like to square them off you get you you're getting the most bang for your buck basically by squaring it off it's more more area and uh where on a saw especially where you can't really go wider you're, you're limited that, that okay. helps we're to the line so we don't need to go any lower okay so i mean really that's a big porting job and on this saw in particular i know there's not much being removed but on some other sides, there's a lot of grinding. I mean, right. there's a lot of grinding, so. That's pretty good. And just go slow, obviously, especially if you're just starting doing this. You, uh, it's always harder to put the material back. Go real slow. That's looking really good. 
And then wiping this dust off is, you're gonna be doing that a million times. So I'm really happy with the shape of that. And now I'm going to where I, these two little, they're really subtle, but I don't have room to work with really to go up. But these are gonna be what I call a lunged or tonsil intake. And it's off of like the old 084, 034 style saws. They came stock like this. These actually, these ports actually have that shape to it a little bit, stock. It's just, it's really subtle, but we're just making it, um, we're exaggerating it a bit, I guess. So I'm just carving these each side out like this, making sure that we don't poke through the other side. You want to be aware of how much material you have. But I'm making that tunnel on each side to follow my, my tracks. You can kind of see how that's shaping up a little bit. It's really subtle, but it does a lot. There we go. So that intake port, I have my rough shape of the intake port. And pull it so quick, will ya? I want to keep that, the middle part as as much down as I can, I guess, each day. So that's why you don't see any markings across it. But that doesn't matter. You know, I, I would lower it if I can. So I don't want to raise it. Don't worry about the discoloration. On these 200s, basically almost every one that you do, they have a 462. It happens to be real bad. You see that? that uh, little spot down at the bottom where the bit didn't touch. Can you, I don't know if you can yeah, see I that. Think so. Just a little tiny sliver yeah, of the gray yeah, there. Yeah. So that is, mm -hmm. these cylinders, when the lining is poured in, they get a lip on the on the intake, of, on, you know, especially the intake, it seems like. And in casting, they'll have like a lip there. I want to get that flat if I can. And I got to be real careful, so I use a hand file. You, you could get it with... Uh, you know, with one of those burrs, but with a good hand file, it's gonna, you're gonna get that thing perfectly, you know what I mean? This file straight, I paid for it to be straight. And then you basically are just, I get that track perfectly level. And I know you only can file going forward, but I go back and forth because it's habit. There, I can feel it went away already. Okay. So it's just kind of a really subtle, really subtle, but you don't, like I said, you do not want to get greedy on these 200s. So now we got an even, even slope in there. And then when I, I rough it up, like I said, we're, our intake is going to have a rough style finish. So now that is good. I will shape uh, the exhaust. So I get all the rough shapes with these bits. And then I switch to a different style bit to, to kind of give it like a second finish. And then the final, uh, basically the final cut it'll be to where we're going to leave it i don't widen them all the way but i do get i go a little bit on the exhaust 110 thousandths so we we could technically go 60 thousandths or so and be and be good but i'm not going to go that far i'm going to widen the exhaust port itself in the cylinder okay. and then this is just like a, a line for guidance you know these measurements are very very small minute measurements and the lines on this is just basically a, a good way to warn yourself because sometimes you get going on these things, especially if you're changing the general shape of it. Once you're past this like crusty cylinder lining and you know, this, this lining on the edge of the reports, basically what I'm trying to say is going to be hard to get through this because this cylinder lining is in there. Once you get past that hard lining, you can take material away so fast and you won't realize you're doing it. Uh, that was, you know, something that when you first start doing it, you'll run into it that, this is aluminum past that lining it's cut so easy that you can you can get really crazy with it so drawing lines is just a really good way to know that don't go past this point i'm gonna widen them about thirty thousands. okay so now we're just gonna shape this up we're not changing the height we're only widening this and we're widening it just by a little bit yeah i can see it right there 
And on a lot of these, you have to look from the inside of the cylinder out. Otherwise, it, you can't look from the outside and see where you're at widening. And the same kind of approach, I like to square them up a little bit. So the outside of that line is 40 thousandths. That's, I don't want to go any yeah. past that, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm basically right there. I know that side's good. Okay, there, I just went through that lining that I was talking about. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's hard to get through that harder lining, but once you're through it now, like if I, if I was to press as hard as I was before, it would go right through it. So you just want to be real careful of that. There's two different materials, technically, when you're grinding these cylinders. So that's really, that's really good too. I'm right at the edge of it. And you just want to be aware that once you get through the lining, you got to really watch what you're doing. Okay. And then now I am, I'm not doing anything to the shape. I'm just going to clean all this out. We have about 40 thousandths of room, which is already really close, but that's just, that's how these saws are. So I know that 40 thousandths is the absolute max. I won't even, I wouldn't even want to get close to it, but I can square the bottom of the exhaust off a little bit. And I know that that's going to be fine too. And I could lower it a little bit if I wanted to, but it's not necessary because the top of the piston uh, is above the floor of the exhaust and when it's at bottom dead center. And that's that hard lining. That's why it doesn't really take material away very easy. It's like a different sound too, you can hear it. You don't want to raise this, so I'm just cleaning it up. So I got my in uh, inside of that really close to where I'm going to keep it. So we know that on a stock cylinder, well, the, the muffler, it doesn't matter, I guess, on a stock cylinder, but this is as big as I like to go. You can go a little bigger, but then you want to make sure that you open up your muffler and the gasket. Otherwise, you're opening that up real big and you're hitting a wall when you hit to the, get to this. So the gasket is usually a little bit on the inside of this. I'm going to open it up just a touch. I'm just barely going to touch this up. I'm going to put this on here to know that that's all the bigger I want to go. Use it as a guide. So now I know that I don't want to really go too much bigger than that. And it just, it's a good way to keep your bearings and keep the shape. You know what I mean? This is nice and uniform. And we want to go to that shape. So now we match. We know our inside shape is good. So how long are you going to make this video? Like three hours? <laughs> well, I thought it would be pretty short, but there's actually yeah, a lot of there's talking. A lot, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. It's probably going to end up being a super long video. Oh, God. You're going to be like, don't get that guy again. <laughs> like this, I mean, you're not oh. going to sit there and show him three hours of grinding. Well, no, I'll cut up some of the grinding bits, but I'm just surprised that just how much... Like how much information there is. It's like really hard to do this. It's really Not, really complicated. It, yeah, I want to. I don't want to make it sound like it's like you know, pat myself on the back. But there is a lot in a lot into this, and a lot of it is experience. Just sending your saw to some guy that's never yeah, pulled I mean, a saw. Yeah, even or, just those. Sorry to interrupt. No, okay. good. But just even those like super minor measurements when you're talking about those, that just tells me that. I'll hop off the stool. You know, that just tells me that you must have 
done a million different times getting the measurements well, exactly right yeah. you know like just trial and error is it, it is intense. a lot of it yeah a little trial and error and uh talking with other builders that's why i love the instagram community it's yeah it's they we share information we help each other we even refer guys like if someone wants a little echo i'll refer them to nick stockel or you know if uh it, use saws i know guys that do use saws that, that you know but it is definitely trial and error. That's why you'll see if you follow my Instagram uh, or YouTube when I make a channel, I do some pretty wild stuff on my saws. Yeah. But it's to find those limits. And I have found limits that you, I think you can only really find it by just taking it to the extreme. See, and see, seeing where the fail point is. Seeing where, you know, how do you find the max? You go past it. <laughs> yeah. That's where. Right. That's how you find it. It's... it's but yeah, there's a lot to this. Uh, I've learned so much though from others. You know, that's I. This yeah. isn't stuff that I just learned one day by myself. Like a lot of guys have really helped me out on this stuff. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. To, it's gonna be a long, boring video, but that's there is right. that uh, probably six people that will will get something out of the information. You know. Hey, you know those six people <laughs> are gonna be mighty grateful. You know. Oh uh, yeah, that's cool. I'm you know glad to glad to do it if they watch. But yeah, we'll see the difference in the end if we run them. Uh, side yeah, by we'll, side. Do, we'll do a side by side comparison. You know how you're saying like this is a long, you know, crazy process. These are like the easiest side of port, Easy, by wow. far, by wow. far the easiest. They're just they're wide open. You know, some some saws like if you look at the cylinder, the uppers will be this little square, and then you got to try to get in there with one of them ninety degree bits, and you can't wow. see half of it. I mean, it's just these are really easy to do. So some of the other ones are really a lot of grain you know, metal shamings that high on the bench when you're done so i got that line where i want it and this all is right. not going to move very much at all so now i'm hitting that hard lining yeah and this bit doesn't have anything on the bottom that's why i like for doing this particular these these transfers minor minor adjustments guys on a different cylinder, there's some that move so far, you're just like, you could take an angle grinder and have at it, but these are very fussy. And these saws are for display purposes only, Yep, right? display purposes, race purposes, and showing off your buddies, but can't take it out on the job, unfortunely. <laughs> yeah. No, you no, it on no, the no, spot. Nobody would ever do that. No. Uh, In handcuffs, instantly. Yeah. So there we go. We're there on the height. Now it's just basically matching it up. And man, I did a good job on those, Jacob. Oh, I we, think maybe we, I could do this for a living someday. We did a good job on this, John. <laughs> we did, yeah. We did a good job. I'm telling you, <laughs> you're going to take your old cylinder and have at it once, and I'm going to record you for my channel. <laughs> yeah, I got to return the favor for the Screaming Eagle. The business I got off of that saw was amazing. That's super cool. The best was when you did the video and you showed all the different saws. Yeah. You got to mine and you got a big smile on your face. I'm like, oh, he likes it. Like, <laughs> I never know. I what love the, that saw. You know, yeah, I never know what people, some people, they get a saw and they, you never hear back from them. You yeah. Know, I don't know if they really liked it. And then I'll, then they want another one like six months down the road. Like, well, they must have liked it. Now I'm going to finish the rest of it with a different bit, but here we go. We all right. have all of our heights done. Look at all that. You got it from here, right? <laughs> yeah. It is a quite the process. I didn't realize it either, really. <laughs> Man, why do I got so much to explain? It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's not that hard. So these, I'm just making it a little bit smoother as well. You know, there's no, nece you're not necessary to widen this. In fact, you wouldn't want to widen these. But now that I changed my height, and just the, the way that they're molded is, is, I think, is why they have the sharper edges. So I'm going to give it smoother edges, basically. And you definitely don't want to take any material out of here if you can avoid it. Yeah, you know, it's so thin already. Yeah. So I, I even leave the, the lining right there. Oh, yeah. I don't even, I don't go any thinner. I don't even like to mess with it at all. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people that are doing this are just going to be doing it with a Dremel. And, and that's fine. You know, there's, I'm not one to be like, oh, you gotta have a, this afford on and all that. You know, I understand that Dremel is about the most realistic tool if you're just gonna do an at home job. Make it a nice, smooth edge. Then I leave the lining on the edges 
where I can. Because I don't like to break the bond of the, you know, it's folded over, the lining kind of pours over the edges. On a really long stretch like that on like the, on a transfer port like this, I don't like to take it off all the way to the edge. Okay. If that makes sense. Kind of breaking that bond a little bit. But that is why I don't do Huskies. And I, I, I like steel saws and as a company. But the Husky, the cylinder lining flakes off. You hear it from others too, it's not just me. But once that flakes off, you're pretty much screwed. I mean, you can try to chase it out, but this this lining, the still cylinder lining, is so strong. It's amazing how much stronger it is. And same with here, too. You want to be real, you don't want to take much material because that goes all the way up like that. It's very thin. You know, we're just taking enough off to take the lining off and get that, that shape in there. Some guys, a lot of guys won't even touch this part of it. I just do it so I can give it a nice finish, make everything smooth. But you could just do adjust that height and leave it if you wanted to. And yeah, now we got a instead of a square sharp edge. to think of it like airflow or water. You got uh, smooth transitions or with less resistance, I guess is the way to say it. So now we got a rough shape. We got our heights where we want them. Uh, I do chamfer the edges of the, the cylinder, so if I could put it back on, it doesn't catch. Ninja. These things work really good for doing chamfering your, your edge because you need to, you don't want that sharp edge like that, especially for when you put the cylinder back on with the rings on it. Everybody knows that these are Dremel sanding drum. Just give it a little bit of an edge, uh, rounded edge like that. Okay, and then in here it doesn't matter just uh, where the, the piston goes on. And then when we put it on too, there's rings, you know, it's, you don't want that sharp edge there. It, the, the rings never go below that anyway when the saw is running, but you want to chamfer that edge for assembly. Now for the intake, I have it shaped how I want it. Looking pretty good. And I'm going to take a coarse, this is 60 grit uh, sandpaper, really coarse. And I'm going to uh, run my bit relatively slowly and I'm gonna give it a roughed up kind of texture to the, to the finish or to the surface. I don't wanna do it real fast, but it's just roughing it up. And what are you roughing it up for? Okay, so you do not want a smooth finish on your intake side, your intake port. Uh, the fuel, it basically stays suspended. You could call it atomized. It, if you think of fuel and air that's going through your carburetor as a, as a mixture, if you don't have that disruption, that texture, that mist, that mix, mist, maybe you'd call it, but it, come, it starts to puddle and separate. Um, it's, it's a hard to explain it. Like think of a spray just bottle. Kind of agitate it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you notice like these intake boots, they have dimples on them. See the oh, dimples yeah. on the inside. Yeah. And, uh, that's the reason for that as well. And just that little bit, you don't want to have like jagged edges and whatnot, but it's, uh, you definitely do not want to have it polished. And I've always heard this and I have tested this theory actually, because I wanted to see and it definitely did not help <laughs> to have it to have it polished. So there is something to it. Okay. And it's got just a little bit of a texture to it is all. And if you I it doesn't really matter the the looks of it if you run your finger across it it's like it just it got a little bit of a roughness to it. It's not okay. it's not smooth. You want the shape to be even but you you don't want this polished basically. Okay. And then you'll see the difference on the the exhaust side, we want to get that thing as, as shiny and smooth and clean as we can. So okay. we're going to switch from the sandpaper to uh, Scotch-Brite. So it's all about getting it so super scotch even. Bright? This is Scotch-Brite, yep. It's a 3M okay. brand of Scotch-Brite, but it's still, uh, okay. it comes in green. The brown is actually for metal. Okay. So I tried this once. I uh, just, I used to use the green and it work but i use this once and this works even better okay i'm gonna zoom in there it's 
So if I didn't have this relatively smooth before I did this though, it's not gonna give it this this kind of a finish. So it is, I mean, it sands, but it's very, very light, if that makes sense. Okay, we are getting there. And if you, it will expose any defects and scratches if you're not really even, but I'm actually pretty even, so it's not. So we're gonna keep going, do a couple more of these, and uh, then I would hit it with the steel wool. Some people don't believe this, but I do not use metal polish on the exhaust ports on the cylinders. I'm gonna show you right now that I wasn't lying. You guys, I don't know why. <laughs> so the WD-40 is almost empty, but I use WD-40. And all because I was told that metal polish is not good for some of the, the materials in the cylinder, like the lining. So WD-40, we know it doesn't hurt anything. This might be a little messy. You might splash your camera. So you can get it really shiny and polished and very nice looking with WD-40. I'm not saying that metal polish is horrible for cylinders. It's just what I was told years and years ago. And I've just always had that in the back of my head because I'm crazy and it just is stuck. Well, your saw's cut, so that's all that matters. So you get that real polish. Yeah, wow. There's WD-40 on it still. If I take a, no, I'll take a, a paper towel and do the same thing as I did with that scotch right. So there you go. Y'all owe me 20 bucks. No metal polish. Jacob would not lie. He sat here the whole time. That is not polished, but it's polished. <laughs> so there we go i mean yeah. that's the that's the finish you want on the exhaust that's the finish you want on the intake and they each have their reasons the exhaust you don't need a rough a rough texture because for one this is going to help with carbon buildup it gives it oh, nothing right. to stick to right and uh you know you want your exhaust to flow we don't need to keep any you know fuel and air mixed it's just straight out the pipe on down the road on to the next one. And uh, yeah, that's it. So it's just ported. Takes a lot more a lot more time than a guy thinks. Holy <laughs> cow. Actually, I just like Jacob's probably really blown like, away. I'm so ready for this, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blown away how complicated what you uh, do is. Yeah, it, really... when, you, when you sit here and explain a lot of it too, it obviously takes a bit longer, but yeah, it's it's a three hour job. I mean I don't know what this, you probably filmed for close to three hours at this point. I bet you I've filmed for three hours at this point. Yeah. And there's so. not a lot to cut out. I mean, you were talking the whole time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Explaining what you were doing. I mean, what a, oh, I mean, hopefully this video really helps somebody though. I think about like just that wealth of knowledge that you just bestowed upon all of us. I mean, yeah, that is I a lot so. of information, you know. There it's is a crazy. lot. Crazy. It must be such a huge learning curve to try to embark on such a venture as learning how to do something like this, you know. I mean, there was so many steps, and yeah, I just have mad respect for <laughs> what I just saw. Yeah, like I'm it's, like blown away. It's pretty great. You so you never uh, like just sat through and watched somebody. I suppose you just send your saws off to like the Gordian. I just send them off, have somebody else do them for me, right? And just uh, yeah, that's it. You know, um, I, I buy most of my saws from Madsons, and they do this thing called the Power Tune. It's like a oh, wood support, yep, yep. and um. It's actually a really good deal. I think it's only like a couple hundred bucks. And it's a crazy good deal. Yeah, and it's nice because they always have saws in stock. So that's oh, yeah. so I like to buy them from them a lot of times. Or if, or if I've had you or Gordy build me saws, but I've never actually seen it done. So I'm kind of like, my mind's kind of blown at just how, how difficult it is, you know? And just the struggle involved in <laughs> making something cut that much better, you know? You can really see... It's just, it's just really impressive, you know, what you did. And Well, yeah, as, as long as the end results are there, uh, it sure would be a lot of work for nothing. So hopefully, hopefully yeah. it runs really good for you. But yeah, and then on to the next. It never, you know, do that to one and then on to the next one. Yeah, <laughs> and you're going to do that to all those. Yeah, all of those and... And a bunch, and a bunch up there too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I've got. And you said the two hundred was easier. The two hundred. Than... The, that's one of the easiest cylinders to do. It really is. <laughs> that's insane. It's easy not because you got you're dealing with finer measurements. You don't have a lot of room to work with. But yeah, it's not a lot of grinding either. It's a small cylinder. The transfer ports are just an open shoot. 
where yeah. some of these other ones are a lot more difficult. You have to use that 90 degree handpiece and That's and wild. Stuff. Yeah. Wild. Well, so, okay. Well, so then we'll slap it back together. And yeah, thanks for watching this. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you know, you want to contact John, check him out on Instagram. Yep. John's Custom Saws. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out my Patreon if you want to support the channel. And yeah, just thanks again, John. Oh, yeah, no so. problem. Glad to do it. Uh, good having you here to watch me. And now at least I got somebody that knows my pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, well, now you've got me and the six people that have watched it this far oh, you know? yeah anybody that yeah it's yeah, definitely like a secret prize like anybody that's yeah that whole thing uh, thank prize. you for that uh, i know it's boring but hey if you want to if you want to do it at least hopefully i can help i know there's a ton of videos on porting i i, I understand that so maybe yeah, well. maybe they missed something and you picked it up on this i guess well cool man yeah thanks john you got it all buddy. right see ya but now I'll bolt everything up on the outside so we know that our carb is incorrectly.